So I would, I would like to, to start by thanking Anne Cambon Thompson for inviting me here. And I would like to thank Eric for organizing, that means putting into order uh, our session. And I very much liked his title, Opening Up Open Science, which I take to mean opening up the black box of open science. Because open science has indeed become a slogan, it has many different meanings, as Yoko al already talked about. It can range from open notebook science, which means everything that an, an experimentator is doing comes online freely to see for everyone, to a hybrid gold open access journal. I very much like Peter Murray Rust's characterization of open science. For him, open science really comes from the heart. It is something scientists do to share their material with other scientists, but also to improve society. But on the, on the other hand, open science is also a marketing strategy. So I think we need to open up this black box to get clarity about what we really want with open science. But I think the real danger is not really the vagueness or the confusion of the concept of open science. The problem is that it, it sounds so good. Who can be against open science? But that's exactly the danger because it allows what's being called open washing, um, which is people like stakeholders pretend, present, uh, pretending to do open science, but in fact not really being open science, or doing some kind of openness, but which not really benefits research or society. So I think this means there are different kinds of open science. There are bad open science, there are uh, different shades of gray of open science. And I think this means that it becomes urgent and necessary to talk about good open science. And I'm speaking from the perspective of a historian and philosopher of science, as Eric already mentioned, but even more so as a member of the Global Young Academy. Um, I have led the Open Science Working Group. I'm now a member of the Executive Committee of the GYA. And this is an academy of young scholars that has a global reach, and one of its main visions is to give young researchers a voice, which includes a voice in the debate of open science. And if you don't know the GYA, I recommend you to look it up online. And so that's what I'm going to do from that perspective, to talk about what good open science means. And I formulated five principles, which I think are important. The first one is good open science is a means. It is not an end in itself. And that's not something I invented. You can find that in the OECD report on open science from 2015. It means that open science should not become just an ideology in itself. And open science should be understood as part of a broader interaction between science and society. I think this is a great first principle because there's already so much embedded in that. And at least it makes us think again, like to what exactly is open science the means? The second principle is that good open science supports good research and innovation. And you're not supposed to read the whole slide here because there's far too much on it. But I want you to focus on the last point just as an example. Good open science uses the full potential of new technologies and does not create new artificial barriers. So if we want good open science, it means that today when computers can read scientific papers, um, they, they are allowed to do so. Although some publishers would argue that the right to read only holds for human people actually reading a paper, uh, it is important to, to be able to use the full technological potential and especially not to create these artificial barriers to close off science again in other ways. The third prim principle that Robert Young uh, also mentioned, open science is a public good. And this seems like many of these principles seem simple and evident, but that's really not the case uh, because almost each of them is being challenged in, in different ways. Take for instance the first one here, good open science is freely and universally accessible. I mean, some publishers have argued that open access should be open only to certain countries and not to others. So actually they're closing off again, uh, even under the name of open science. 
Another issue which shows that open science is part of, of a broader problem of the relationship between public good and private interests and how we can actually create an, a, a good interaction between both. And we can go into more detail in discussion if you want to. But I think that also points to uh, what I think is an ideal of good open science that would privilege a service model of scientific publishing in which the scientist and the scientific community keeps control of the content, but also the rights uh, of, of processing this content, like in the meta, metadata, uh, machine reading, um, indexes, and, and metrics based on all this material. A fourth principle is that with good open science, you don't disempower the scientists. And I think this is especially important from my perspective as uh, a GYA member speaking for a young scientist and also for like the global, uh, the global perspective um, on open science. The first one is that in implementing open science, the burden shouldn't be on the researchers. The researchers are already overstretched with administration, teaching, grant applications, all these things. So if there is new implementations, these should be simple, but there should also be help and so therefore funding to implement this and to help researchers to achieve open science. Open science has different faces. One of our members talked to me about um, not being able to go to conferences, the key conferences in her field, because she didn't have the funding. She came from the Global South, which means access, open access is more than uh, just reading papers. It's also participating and going to the places where science really happens. This means, again, empowering those who are disempowered in the system. I think this is very important for good open science. And continuing on that, um, I think open science policy should not disempower even more those who are already disempowered in the system, and notably young scholars, uh, scholars from low and middle income countries, and uh, the soft disciplines. And this is something that uh, is maybe a little bit surprising, but many people in the global south, researchers, actually are a bit suspicious about open science and open data, because they feel this is another way to extract data from them without getting anything in return. So they see this as a kind of neo-colonial science and a way of extractive science. And so this is something to be taken into account. And the fifth principle is good open science needs a supportive research culture. It actually needs a new culture of collaboration. It needs new culture of evaluation and also a new kind of trust within science. Because science can be messy and science can fail. Science fails most of the time. So we need a space in which we are allowed to fail and where we can put that into the open. And I think these changes need to happen before we get really behavioral change, before science, scientists will be willing to actually bring all their material and all, all, all their actions into the open. Now you may think this is idealistic nonsense, but that misses the point because I think, well, this is actually meant as a practical and pragmatic proposal. Of course, this is not something to be reached immediately, but these are guidelines when we make practical and pragmatic decisions on open science. This is something to keep in mind. This is something to strive for. That's the direction we want to go. It's also a way to evaluate new policy proposals or proposals from stakeholders. Our actions should be pragmatic, but they should also be principles-based. And that's necessary because open science can go wrong in so many ways. If history teaches us something about open science, it's actually not that science has always been open. In fact, it's almost a country. Open science is fragile. History shows that there have been pockets of open science and open applied science and open technology in different contexts with different structures and characteristics, but most of them did not survive. So we're actually very lucky we have something like open science and it needs to be protected and nurtured. And especially because soon we will face new challenges and new technological disruptions. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much to uh, our, uh, our panelists. As I had said at the uh, outset, there are two microphones, one to my uh, right and left. I would invite you to make your way uh, to the microphone. Uh, it would also be useful if you could say your name and an affiliation. It could be your country, it could be your institution, whichever you uh, prefer. And I'll just uh, probably be quite fair and go back and forth. So if there's a question on uh, this microphone, please go ahead. And if you want to direct it generally or to a person, by all means, do so. Okay. Uh, my name's Emma Pusey. I'm from the journal eLife. And um, my question is a general question. A general question. Um, there are lots of initiatives to make um, science and data more available, but it still requires a high technical knowledge to actually be able to use it. So I was wondering, are there any policies in place to try and make it more understandable and easier to use? Well, maybe, you know, like I could refer then to Jean-Claude Bürgelmann's Open Science Cloud now, which is going to think about providing that type of infrastructure for collective, well, for data collection across uh, many different universities in Europe. And of course, it takes annotation of that data and, and the experts come together and, and give that type of um, expertise of how to do that. But first of all, you need to build a platform, and that is what Europe, with the Open Science Cloud, uh, is doing. So I'm not sure if that, this is really answering your question, but there are many different local initiatives to support open science. And you see also that like universities like Oxford have offices and support to actually help people to become open, but others don't, and I think there, there is a great disparity there. Uh, there are many initiatives at the local, national, European level, but from the beginning, we start to have some global common understanding, that to have some kind of standard, if you want, to make sure that it's not isolated for some parts in the world, but working in the hand in hand, the same direction. It will take time, but you have, need to have pressure from politicians to go ahead quickly and as soon as possible, as pragmatic as possible, as simple as possible. I will only add, I think your question is, is doubly important if the uh, point of uh, Robert Jan's uh, argument, which I thought was so compelling and almost so obviously compelling, which is why it's so good, uh, a kind of reciprocity, the uh, the golden rule, if you have the gold, you get to make the rules, and that is placed on the, the shoulders of funders. Uh, but there are those who would be beneficiaries of open science who are not themselves researchers, who are not themselves um, uh, individuals working in an environment with even access uh, to the World Wide Web and the like. And I think your question speaks to not simply the technical manipulation of a platform, but the very technology that's supposed to enable might itself be a potential barrier. And I know that's an issue uh, well aware of those uh, by those on the panel. So thank you very much. Let's go to the next microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Matthias Bjarnman, Imperial College London. I just wanted to ask if the commission and the panel think that hybrid journals has a part of the open science future, or is it a thing of the past? I wait with my view and let the others say first. <laughs> well, to be brief, I think it's for the past. I think in the new uh, Europe Horizon program, it's a thing of the past. Uh, it's a question of transition management because we have to have some programmatic approaches in the way that hybrid could be some potential. But in the longer term, we may have some more ambitious goal. So we don't know how long it will take the transition, but intention is as quick as possible. So still we, we have to be uh, not eliminating from the beginning, but taking advantage of exploring all the potential and say what should be the, the end. 
No, I will say what I think of it. Um, I think, Yuko, you made a good statement. I mean, the hybrid journals, if they are part of a transition, a quick transition, as is being negotiated at the moment, for instance, with Max Planck and some of the publishers, that is acceptable. But I have the feeling that they have been introduced to again continue with the current system, which is a subscription-based model. So in other words, it's a clever way of just continuing with the status quo. And that is something where I'm extremely suspicious with regard to the role of hybrid journals, because I see that they are not necessarily helping us to get to this full and immediate open access which we want. And therefore, as Yuko said, if they are part of a transition period and part of the negotiations like Max Planck is having them, there's no problem for one or two years. But you know, we can't have these for a period up to 10 or 15 years, because then again, there will not be the full and immediate open access we've been waiting for. The Berlin Declaration on Open Access was in 2003, 15 years ago. And as I mentioned, for 15 years, we went from 15% full and immediate open access to 20. And I don't want these hybrid journals to be another, say, blockage to, to accelerate the system. So for that reason, I have mixed feelings with regards to hybrid journals. And like Kuhn and Camilla said, uh, this is a system, they are part of the old system and not of the modern way we would like to go to. So as part of a transition period, I can live with it, but it has to be a damn short transition period. Thank you. Let's go over here. Holly else, I'm a reporter at Nature. My question is for Robert Jan Smith. I wonder if you can tell us a bit more about Planis, uh, and secondly, are the publishers aware or involved at all? As a matter of fact, uh, the first, say, stakeholders I talked to when I got this assignment uh, were the publishers. So I've met with the Federation of European Publishers, I met with the CEOs of the, of the big publishing companies, because they are very impressive companies with a long tradition, and I also wanted to hear from them how they saw the transition to full immediate open access. And as a matter of fact, many of the ideas of Plan S come from them. Because what I always did when I met with them, but also with open access journals, I met with Camilla, I met with the Young Academy. I mean, when I meet with people, I always ask a very simple question. If you'll be in my position, and you have to give President Juncker uh, recommendations to speed up the process to full immediate open access, what would you do? Well, and the funders, uh, sorry, the uh, publishers, the traditional publishers, they more or less gave you know, the answer, which is this plan S. Well, they say, as long as there is demand for subscription journals, as long as scientists want to publish there and have the possibility to publish there, then, of course, we will serve that market. But for the moment that the things dry up because the funder does not allow it anymore, well, then we have to flip the journals to open access. Well, it's a very simple uh, uh, solution which the publishers themselves brought to my attention. And can you give us any more details about the plan? Well, as I said, I mean, we are at the moment um, working with the funders, and I want to have a critical mass of funders um, behind Plan S before I will announce it. We have a great cooperation with Science Europe, uh, which is the network, the European um, Association of National Research Councils, and uh, Mark Shields, who's the president, is really a strong and keen supporter of Plan S. But I need a bit more time. I had hoped that I could do it here. I need to get a bit more time to get a critical mass of funding agencies on board. I'm not there yet. I had hoped that this would be the event I could announce it, but I need a bit more time, which is also understandable because it is quite a revolution what we are proposing, and it will really be a break with the past, and it will have consequences for the system. And that's why I also understand why certain funders in certain countries say we need a bit more time to reflect over it, but I really want this to be announced before the summer break starts. And now you're going to ask me when the summer break starts, of course. Thank you very much. Let's go to this microphone here. Uh, congratulations, everyone, for such an inspiring uh, panel. Uh, my name is Eva Mendez. I'm a Jerome representative in, open in the Open Science Policy Platform. By the way, Jerome is one of the biggest supporters of the open science policy. 
and I think it's very valuable, the, the universities that we are born with the web, that we have to uh, move the world to, to help open science happen. I have a comment and, and a question. Uh, thank you, Camilla, because you were very, uh, very uh, interested in, in speech and the, the way that I have to convince my president to move to open access. But it's the, uh, the traditional, uh, the traditional uh, landscape for research. I would like to know what, is, what do you think that is going to be the disruptive way to make open science happen? And I have to disagree with you when you said that um, the, um, the citation, it is uh, an indicator of quality. I disagree completely. Citation is an indicator of popularity. Uh, and, and my question is uh, for all of you. Uh, we have been doing, we have been uh, 15 years, like you were, Robert Jan said, uh, 15 years from Berlin Declaration. What we have done wrongly? And what is your definition for the whole panel about excellence in science and how can open science help excellence? Thank you very much. Okay, so I think. I actually agree with Robert Jan. I think the signal comes really, what have we done wrongly or what have we not done enough? The signal comes, needs to come very, very strongly from the funders because researchers do quite a lot to get a grant. And if the funders say it needs to be an open access, they will do as the funders say. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has shown that it is possible. Others are implementing it. Let's do it at a large scale. That means to mandate, please publish your research if you want to have money from us in an open access journal. I think if that is implemented, it will go much, much faster. The other thing you know, like, that I believe has not been done and that uh, every university administrator, every funder can implement as well is about the evaluation process. Because indeed today people look and, and it's very compelling, you know, like where have people published and what kind of journals have they published in order to evaluate whether they should get a grant, whether they should get the tenure. I do believe we need to move to article level and author level metrics. The technology is there. We, for example, have pioneered much of this technology already 10 years ago, but you can also get it from Web of Science or Scopus or wherever to really find out how many views, downloads, citations, Whatever it is that you want, I'll follow your guidance. If you tell me which metrics to use, I'll implement them. Uh, but at the article level, how, many, how much impact did this article have? You can translate that into author metrics, you can translate it into university metrics or whatever, and start using that as one of the main indicators. Of course, you need to read the papers, you need to be qualitative as well. Nobody says that you shouldn't be doing, but if you have to do quick decisions and let, allow numbers to help you, it probably should not be the journal impact factor, which is a great way how to evaluate and rank journals, but not people. That should be done on author level metrics. Um, you asked a good question as I tried to also address in my presentation. What went wrong? Why did we go in those 15 years since the Berlin Declaration from 15% for open access to 20? Why is it so slow? And uh, as Camilla also said, and I tried to say that in my presentation, when the ministers, the politicians said, we want to have by 2020 full immediate open access, they left the room and then they said to the fund, to the uh, universities, you sort it out. And then these universities had to negotiate with these big publishers. And uh, this was, of course, you know, very often I say uh, David against Goliath. And the only, the only time that David has won was in the Bible. And all the other times, Goliath won. These publishers are, of course, extremely strong organizations, and they know exactly what they paid uh, and what they offered as conditions to the different countries uh, because and there were confidentiality agreements, so the German university did not know what the French were paying. So, I mean, it was, of course, extremely stupid of the politicians to say, listen, we have a target, and now we leave it to the university to try to sort it out. That was the big mistake. And the ones who did not take the responsibility were the funders and they have the key to the solution. They set the rules of the game. The funder decides. Now, um, interestingly enough, and that's nice about my new job, I can read a lot and I can talk a lot. 
And one of the strongest inhibitors to accelerating this the, the phase two fuller meter and open access is the science community itself. The science community itself, which is extremely, how should I say, hypocritical, may I use it? If I ask a scientist, do you want to have access immediately to the data of your colleague and to his publications? Yes, immediately, open access. And what do you want to publish yourself? Well, I prefer a subscription journal, even if there's an embargo. So there's hypocrisy in the system. And we should also get rid of this obsession with the high impact journal. And there's only one metrics on which we are basing at the moment reward systems in universities, you know, that people get a reward, you make a career, because if you publish in a high impact journal, we don't give rewards for people who do citizen science, who share data, who work for the local economy, or who transfer knowledge to, to the industry. I mean, that's not happening at all. So we should really get rid of this obsession with one metrics and develop uh, new metrics. So there needs to be also a cultural change in our universities, in our science community. And I discovered that there's a lot of hypocrisy. And uh, the same when I, meant, uh, when I met with uh, some presidents of the top European universities, they all said, yes, open science and open access, we need open access immediately. And then I asked them, who amongst you are still working on the editorial board of a subscription journal? And then, you know, eh, half raised their hands. I mean, come on, get real. Either you're full and immediate open access, or you are, want to keep the traditional system in place, subscription-based model. But there's nothing against that, but let's be clear then about it and stop the hypocrisy which is at the moment so present in the system. Just one thing with regard to the traditional journals. Um, and I mentioned that I, mentioned, uh, that I met the, sorry, the traditional publishers uh, at several occasions. I want them to be part of the change. I want them to go into open access journals, and many of them are already doing it for a simple reason that they have a fantastic peer review system. They have amazing journals, so I want them to flip. That is my only objective, which when I meet with them, I said, you know, don't try to stick to old-fashioned business models. The film industry did not succeed and the music industry does not succeed. And you also will not succeed as publishers. Join the change, join the open access movement and become champions, become champions of the change. You have a couple more comments from your large question. We'll make them brief, uh, Ken. I think it's a brilliant question. I think open open science and evaluation are so intertwined, it's, it's sometimes hard to take them apart. And it's more than open access, even if that uh, contributes to scientific excellence, I'm sure. Uh, open data, replicability, there are so many examples. Um, open peer review, we haven't talked about that uh, and how that can play a role uh, in, in evaluation. And I think... I mean, I'm very skeptical, skeptical about the metrics, and I think we really need to find new ways of qualitative evaluation, which may include open peer review and having like peer review other roles in the system uh, being picked up because everything is already evaluated in, in many ways, right? But it's not being taken into account in the system later on. Um, but I just have to disagree on one point with Robert Young, uh, which is the hypocrisy of the researchers. I, I trust the scientists. Um, it's, it's maybe in my genes, I don't know. Um, and I think like 95% of them would like to change, would go open access, would go open science, um, but they need support and they need systems and roadmaps. And it's also not their job. Their job is to do the science and they like try to find the most easy way to get the thing published and they want to continue in the lab. Um, so we need uh, really well thought through support systems to make this happen. Just a few words about excellence. Excellence is not a definite concept, evolving concept. And today, any more evaluating, assessing research activity with a monolithic thinking. So we have a way now to have multiple way to measure assess, including metrics we have. But the danger to stick to the metrics only is that you are uh, modifying the reality. So we need to have complementary approaches to show that what is excellence. And you have to discussion, have a discussion within your community, across community, to define what's the goal as the excellences. 
it's evolving. So it's up to us to take advantage of existing tools, data, and the papers in a way to really move ahead with science. Thank you. We'll and in I will four seconds and, and close my mouth I will just finish your 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 intervention on this on this topic with the sentence that I said in the call for action in Amsterdam we all agree that we need to to, to change the way we measure science but we don't do it thank you <laughs> we'll come over here thank you for waiting hi um, Beth Baker plus um, we've spoken quite a lot about open access um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about going beyond that to what Yuko called uh, open knowledge production, including open peer review and so on. Thanks. Anyone want to jump in? Yeah, you had mentioned. You're on the, there's the mic. Well, I guess in a way my whole presentation was on open science more generally uh, than open access. And I really think we need to, to think more broadly uh, about open science. I mean, people yeah, were mentioning open peer review. I think it's a very interesting model. Um, at the same time, um, people are often afraid of open peer review. So this is also a debate the scientific community still needs to, to, to have. Um, and so I, I had on the slide uh, at some point the the need for safe spaces to some extent, like where researchers can do their things without being shut down immediately. And so I understand sometimes it is, uh, it's, it, it, yeah, it's not comfortable that every comment on your work may be out there in the open. Uh, at the same time, I think it's useful and I think the culture needs to change that that becomes acceptable and like, well, good negative comments are actually a very good thing. Um, but that demands a change in, in culture, I think that's needed. I disagree a little bit, but I think you just have to do it, you know? When we started uh, Frontiers, we, about 10 years ago, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary now, we said on every article that needs to, that is peer reviewed, the names of the peer reviewers and the editor needs to be just put there. And you know, like everybody said, oh no, I don't want to put my name there. Uh, it's, we don't want this, uh, it's, it's not nice, it's gonna, you know, like corrupt the peer review, I can't say what I want, da da da. We said, well, you know, like, that's the, that's the rules. <laughs> that's how it's going to work here. If you want to be part of it, you got to put your name on the paper. And then everybody did it. We published 90,000 papers with everybody's name on it. We can also make the peer reviews uh, publicly available. But why not? This type of transparency actually improves the quality. Nobody wants to be associated with a bad paper. They may do a better job in it. You can look up the people. You can see their entire publication history online. It just improves the rigor and the quality in the entire process. And I think, you know, like it's, one doesn't even need to debate it. One just needs to do it and it's already been done and more and more publishers should be doing it. 90,000 papers is not an insignificant amount of, of papers. Nobody's complaining about it. To the contrary. I'll just add one thing about uh, your reference to, to Yuko's, I thought, excellent point about uh, knowledge. What has not yet been mentioned is the, the ecosystem here that includes not only funders, but that act, uh, funders' responsibilities or expectations regarding uh, open access. But the movement that has slowly, same kind of snail's pace, in um, requirements as a condition of grant award for dissemination plans, for knowledge translation plans. In fact, some of the major funding bodies that we're all familiar with now have senior level positions in their organization for vice president of knowledge translation and the like. I think we are all struggling with what those aspirational, I won't say slogan, but aspirational phrases actually mean. So while I share um, Robert Jan's, I would say, frustration if I can read your body language with the amount of time, on the other hand, science has the capacity to move very quickly when it wants to. You know, we sequenced the SARS coronavirus in about six weeks because it was a really good idea to do that and nobody cared about, I'm referring to you, I'm sort of yeah, the yeah. general comment, nobody cared about publication. There was a public health uh, requirement. So it turns out that some of this is about political will, some of it is about what kind of 
economic drivers there are, and some of it is about the conservatism of of many of the industries, and I include the academic industry uh, in that. So it's not surprising in a way that this is going slowly, but I do think we've reached a tipping point, which is what I hope this panel is alerting you to. It's no longer, is this a good idea? Of course it's a good idea. How do we start to deal with the obvious impediments that are confronting us with this uh, this sort of valley of death. Okay, end of my editorial. Uh, let's go to the uh, 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 microphone to my right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. My name is Jürgen Knudelseder. I'm doing astrophysics here in Toulouse for CNRS. 